Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you tonight uh, to Europe, US economic and political relations under the Biden administration, our online conference with Professor Georges Uge. Uh, my name is Chantal Schuster, and I'm the president of the Columbia University Club of Belgium. Um, I will be co hosting this event with Rafael Prezerovitz. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple of administrative items. Uh, the Zoom event will be recorded. We will be sharing the link with you uh, once we have edited it, and it will last about one hour. Uh, the microphones will be muted during the conference. Um, I would also like to express uh, our thanks to all of those who have helped uh, to make this event happen tonight. First of all, to you, Professor Uge. Thank you for being so quick to say yes when Raphael called you and uh, to a grand date so promptly. Uh, it's been, it's wonderful to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Raphael, because you were the initiator of this event um, and you made it happen. And I also would like to express our thanks to Paul Lindbergh. I don't know, I don't think he's with us yet, maybe a little bit later. He's our uh, liaison uh, at the Columbia Alumni uh, Association in New York. And um, he also does a lot of work behind the scenes to, to help us with, with our events. Uh, last and uh, but not least, thank you to all of you for being with us tonight. Um, Europe, US economic and political relations under the Biden administration has attracted a large audience with attendees from Columbia clubs in Belgium, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Poland and the United States. Uh, we have also seen tonight that we have participants that uh, are logging in from Turkey, Singapore and Morocco. And uh, I would also like to welcome our friends from the Riders Club. We have participants uh, from Stanford University, Kellogg, Harvard, Chicago, the London Business School and INSEAD. Uh, moderating today's discussion uh, is Rafael Prezerovitz, who is also co-hosting. Uh, Rafael is a graduate of, from the Columbia Business School, where he received his MBA in 1997. He is a partner at Altimis Consulting, a strategy and business transformation consulting company that he founded in 2003. Rafael is a former president of the, of the Columbia Club of Belgium and the current board member. So Rafael, I'm handing over to you now. It's, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Chantal, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, I would like also to start by thanking all the participants tonight, not only for uh, being with us, but also for uh, the uh, quantity and the quality of the questions, uh, which we transmitted to Monsieur, to Professor Uge. And as you will notice, uh, those questions have been, uh, to a large extent, integrated in the presentation of uh, Professor Uge. Uh, but of course, we invite you to post all your questions in the uh, chat. Uh, uh, as we go along, and we'll do our best to address uh, most of them during the uh, Q&A uh, session. Uh, so tonight, we are very pleased and honored uh, to welcome Professor Georges Uge. Uh, Georges Uge is a dual citizen of Belgium, his native country, and the United States, where he lives and from where he will be speak speaking tonight, actually from uh, New York City. Uh, Georges Uge began his career in the 70s in uh, Europe, in the banking industry. Uh, from 96 to 2003, Mr. Uge was the group executive vice president at the New York uh, Stock Exchange, where he built and managed the exchanges uh, international uh, group. He is currently the chairman and CEO of Galileo Global Advisors LLC, a firm he founded in 2003, offering advice on international business development, restructuring, compliance, and uh, mergers and acquisition. Mr. Uge is a lecturer at Columbia University School of Law, where he teaches the seminar International Banking and Finance, and he's also a visiting professor at La Sorbonne in Paris, and a guest lecturer at the UCL here in Belgium, from which he holds a doctorate in law. 
He's the author of uh, several books, um, one of which is uh, The Descent into Hell of uh, Finance, which was published in 2019, or International Finance Regulation, The Quest for Financial Stability, published in 2014. And he makes frequent appearances in the media, for example, in La Première or L'Echo in Belgium, or Le Monde, BFM, just to cite two uh, French media. So the topic for today is uh, Europe-US economic and uh, political relations under the Biden administration. Why this topic? Well, as an alumni association of uh, Columbia University here in Belgium and having all lived in New York at least for a couple of months, uh, it is clear that the relations between Europe and the United States is a subject that we all continue to follow with great interest and, and we, we love to organize discussions on that topic on, um, as, 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 uh, every time we get a chance. Uh, so today, after an uh, historic year 2020, marked by a global pandemic and an unprecedented U.S. presidential election, we are witnessing fundamental changes in all fields, political, economic, technological, environmental, etc. And therefore, we are thrilled to receive today Georges Jeu to enlighten us on the current uh, economic and political uh, reality in the United States under the Biden administration, uh, but also on the evolution of the US with Europe and with other parts of the world, such as uh, China. Professor Jeu, on behalf of the Columbia University Club of Belgium, I would like to warmly welcome you and thank you for your presence with us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chantal and Raphael, for this kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to be part of uh, uh, the vibrant activity of the uh, Columbia alumni. And uh, the topic that you have chosen and that we discussed is indeed uh, very close to my heart on, uh, on one side, but also very timely. Yesterday night, I watched President Biden speaking for, uh, to the uh, Congress, i.e. the two chambers, the Senate and the House of Representatives, about what he intends to do. And it was extraordinarily powerful. Uh, it was rejected as socialist by the Republicans, as expected, because every time you are uh, trying to uh, promote the notion of a sort of solidarity economy or social economy, you are uh, considered to be fundamentally a socialist in this country. Uh, I'm going to uh, share with you a presentation that I made for this. Uh, okay. That's it. Uh, I'd like to uh, put the context first before going into some specifics. But uh, the first one is we should be under no illusion that uh, Russia and China are testing what they call the delinquency of the West. And Russia is considered by the Biden administration as an enemy and China as a competitor. But that doesn't mean that Europe sees the situation the same way. In the speech of the president, the whole issue of the democracy and the autocracy is at the forefront. And we were discussing with a Turkish colleague earlier about the problem of the autocrats. And what we have seen is the emergence of autocracy at a number of ways, not just because of the regime in China and Russia, but we also see countries like Turkey, Egypt, Philippines, uh, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, Hungary uh, and Poland going into uh, the reduction of what is our common assessment of a democracy should be. So there are a lot of internal extremists moving in democracy. The third element is that uh, there are some issues uh, that uh, are making the immigration situation much more difficult 
and uh, we will talk about it, but the pressure comes from South America and the US and comes from North Africa for Europe. Uh, the fourth element is that uh, the Trump administration has been a retreat from the multilateral initiatives and from what I would call international trade, which is what the US itself had built. And we need to redefine what we mean by globalism, because I believe that the model that we've been living with uh, will be replaced gradually by multipolarity. And I will talk about it a little bit later. And then I will spend some time about the field where I'm particularly specialized, but also particularly scared. Uh, as I was listening to President Biden, and I was heading the trillions, the question that we have is where is the money going to come from? And is there a risk of a sovereign debt explosion? And what does that mean for capital markets and central bank? To rebuild the uh, transatlantic trust, two main things need to happen. The US must respect Europe. And what I mean by that is that, uh, oh, sorry, I, Chantal, uh, I sorry. Maybe we do the polling now? You're on mute, Chantal. Yes, uh, so we are launching the, the first uh, poll. Um, as we'd like to make this session uh, also interactive. So, so please uh, uh, take a second to, to vote in this poll and we'll share the results uh, instantly. So Chantal, if you could maybe relaunch the poll. Okay, thank you. Can we now share the results, uh, Chantal? Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think uh, we see uh, some optimism here uh, with uh, almost 90% of uh, improvement expected in the, the US-EU relations under the Biden administration. So if I had to summarize uh, the um, situation, the way I see it at the top level, is that the two sides have a huge challenge. Uh, over the past decade, the focus on what is happening in Asia uh, and the traditional uh, attitude towards Europe has not been terribly respectful. I don't need to tell you what the kind of Euro bashing that is there, but there is another element of the respect is that I strongly believe that the United States must recognize that it is um, expected to understand the damage that has been done in the US-EU relationship over the past four to five years. The progress on climate change was a common initiative and has been abandoned. Uh, the issue of defense is an important element and trade is not just the question of the balance of goods, but we should also look at the balance of services. Can we take the poll out, Chantal? So that people can uh, see the slides. Uh, it's out normally. 
Rafael, do you have something okay. that you could... it was not out for me. It's okay. The second problem is, of course, the difficulty, which remains the fundamental difficulty of Europe, and I'm totally pro-European. Uh, can Europe actually have a common policy vis-a-vis -vis the United States? And the answer is that at the moment, it is fragmented. And is Europe willing to look at the United States and rebuild the trust that has been broken during the, the trust that has been broken during the Trump years? And Europe is asking itself, what is the nature of the commitment that the United States is are taking when they sign the treaty. We have seen that on treaties for China, for Europe, for Iran, for everything going down. But Europe has a different model. It can work with the Biden administration and it will need to adjust to the new United States. And what I'm trying to say is that both sides need each other. There is no future for the transatlantic uh, situation, but to improve from where it was. One of the biggest issues has been the trade. And I'm not going to read you all the numbers here, but I want you to be aware of one thing. First, when you see what happened over the last uh, couple of years, the budget deficit of the United States on a, month, on a quarterly basis has been increasing substantially. So the measures that have been taken have not improved the situation of the balance of goods of the United States. But if you look at the two bullets in the bottom of the slide, you are going to see that there is very little where actually the US and Europe uh, compete. And if you look at the, uh, for instance, there are uh, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, imported in the United States are much bigger than what they export. Uh, on the other side, they are big in optical instruments. Uh, the vehicles, the cars, come from Europe to the United States. Basically, the US car companies have abandoned any plans to be present in Europe. So what I'm trying to say here is that international trade between Europe and the US should not be seen as conflictual, but much more seen as something that is absolutely complementary for both countries. What is interesting uh, also is that uh, the US has a big trade surplus, as you might expect, in uh, services. So if you want to take an honest picture, you have to realize that what we're talking about is about 130 billion uh, in favor of Europe. That is not a major issue at the moment. However, what struck me listening to President Biden yesterday night is that we should not believe that protectionism is dead because Biden is back. He was telling things like, there is no reason why we could not produce in the US what we are producing in China. He was saying, buy America, buy America, buy America. So this is very important. Among the outrageous uh, problems that happened with the, Biden, with the Trump administration, there are some fundamental trends. And the US has its own protectionism, and by the way, so does Europe. The question one of you has been asking is, uh, what will be the long-term effect of the Trump? The first thing is that we have discovered in the United States that the president has more power than we thought. He has been able to crush the judiciary. He has been able to crush the parliament. And the US 
give the president a power that raises the question of the value of the US commitments. The influence on Trump on the Republican Party continues to be extremely strong. The question of the judicial in, uh, independence and the situation of the Supreme Court is a source of concern. So if we see the weakened commitment of the United States going to change, it is extremely important to know whether this is something that we love. Uh, one of the damages that has happened is that Donald Trump and his administration have created more enemies of the United States that need it. And so there is a big repair on the diplomatic side. The situation of human rights in the United States has been exacerbated and it's far from over. Already this morning, there have been 13 deaths, including some police people. It happens every day. And last but not least is the point that I was making before is, is the United States ready to be multilateral? Because we left treaties, we left the organization, we questioned NATO, we didn't uh, play the game with uh, the United Nations and so on and so forth. So, the United States is not naturally multilateral. And we have to be realistic. Let me give you an example. The court in Den Haag, which is for war crimes. The US has a lot of positions on that court, but it's not a member. Why? Because the United States did not believe that anybody but the US could judge war crimes committed by US citizens and the US Army. So we have to realize that there are elements in what was in the previous regime that are structural to the country. So what are the main issues? And I'm going to take some of them. I believe there is a new chapter for EU-US relations. The question is how strong will it be? So let me take... Uh, a series of items, I cannot cover everything. Very interesting to see the rhetoric of the Biden administration. We are going to launch the most extraordinary of effort on climate change, blah, 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 blah. The reality is that the movement of common, uh, on climate change has come from Europe. And it's Europe who created the movement in the United Nations and eventually got the agreement of the US. But the climate change movement is not a US movement. Of course, when Biden invites 40 countries to have a discussion on climate change, he likes to look like he is managing it. But the discussion was more interesting in terms of what the US has to do. Uh, the application of the COP21, however, has not been very stellar in Europe. So it's not just the US on the climate change and ESG that we have to talk about, because I'm interested to see what the French have been saying after the famous summit, and they are going to reduce, except that the French have not applied the COP21. The two sides are developing an ambitious green plan and they are converging. Um, it was partisan, and we need now to make sure that scientific evidence and bipartisanship dominates the climate change uh, debate. It is a planetary problem. And what we need is a very strong US, Canada, Japan, EU, and UK alliance to draw the dynamics of the other countries. We also have to be very realistic about the recuperation through the greenwashing of ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance. And it has been looked at fundamentally on the climate side, but there is not a lot of progress on the social and the governance side. It's the corporate world that is, at the moment, on both sides of the Atlantic, 
driving that more actually than the government. But we all are facing an energy transition and we are going to have a major uh, funding challenge. Global warming is for us and for the next generation a survival problem. And the question that I'm raising there is a question that we don't address often enough. Is the money that we spent in exploring Mars well allocated or could it be used to survive the planet? The good news is that this European movement, and it's moving at the moment, you can see that Europe was at the start. Uh, Europe, the, the ESG assets and the management that you can see by countries has been moving extremely fast. And uh, we are not talking about uh, hopes that uh, we will reach uh, 40 trillion of assets and the management. That's a substantial amount of money. The question is, is it because we have diluted the definition of ESG or is it really solid? But it is a source of hope. Let me talk about the immigration issue. I am very uneasy about what happens on the migration side, because I believe that migration has happened in the last millenniums. We have had movements of population happening all the time. And the global migration happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. You see that the number is 258 million migrants in 2017, and I found that map to be very telling. But we have also to look at the fact that 63 of this million is Asia to Asia. And that at the end of the day, Europe is having something like 57 million and the United States 51. So we are confronted with about uh, the same number of migrants. But what needs to change is the way we handle it. Because migration is always going to be there, and because the wealthy countries are always going to be those where everybody goes, we should not reinvent the question of migrants every time. We have to have a structure where we consider migrants to be essential, especially when the last statistics, including in the United States, show that we had the lowest growth in the history of the US. For the last 10 years, the United States had seen a growth of their own population of 7.4%, less than 1% a year. Let's move on to one of the most thorny and the most complicated situation, which is the situation of China. I happen to have been working uh, on a number of Chinese projects. I have been on the board of directors of China uh, insurance companies. And so we have to be very clear that we cannot address China as one single issue. And I want to distinguish three main issues and look at first the trade. That is the area where the di discussion is the toughest one. And you see that there is a surplus and that the biggest surplus is in the United States and it has continued to grow. It's the red line during the Trump administration and it will continue to grow. The European Union is a surplus but we have to ask ourselves a question. What is the composition of that surplus? And one of the things that I'm telling the US trade people is that how much of that is US companies 
producing in China at a cheaper price. Apple is the best example with Foxtrom of production capacity, which represents effectively an export from China to the US, but it is because it would be too expensive to produce the uh, iPad in the United States. So when we accuse China of trade dumping or whatever, we are not necessarily very honest. And the question, the fact that we export from China is not something to be blamed of, but we need to make the difference. The second thing that is important is that we have seen now an extraordinary uh, evolution of public opinion in the United States against China. And you see now that 65% of the United States consider China disfavorably. But if you look at the reasons, you can see also that it is something that is motivated sometimes by the wrong reasons. In Europe, we, have, we don't have a consensus. But we have to be clear, the US wants to destroy China. Europe wants to play China, despite the disagreements, in a smart way. This is the biggest disagreement on foreign policy between China and Europe. And of course, where we meet the US is on human rights and particularly on the Uyghur situation. Professor Uge, we may maybe take a second now to launch the second poll. Yes. If it works, of course. It's the, it's the risk of public debt and it's been launched. Yeah, people are answering. Can you see the results? Yes, thank you, Chantal. I think we all can see the result as a, as a transition to the uh, uh, chapter uh, about uh, sovereign debt. So I'll just let you read the poll and uh, let Professor Je continue. For the number of years, some of you who follow what I've been thinking and writing is has been my main concern is the risk of sovereign debt. The excuse of the financial crisis of 2007 and now the reason of the pandemic have created a situation where the advanced economies have more than 120% of GDP. And you remember that Europe is about 60%. There is no capital adequacy for the banks who so they buy uh, government bonds, but the reality is that we have a huge problem of budget deficit. What is also important in this slide is to see that the problem of emerging markets is much less problematic in percentage of GDP. And if you look at it from a number standpoint, the numbers are uh, much lower. We are talking about a uh, 70 trillion uh, of debt, of which uh, the, what is called the West is probably 50 trillion uh, and 20 is for the rest of the world. You see here that we have countries like Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, New Zealand and Australia who have been managing their government debt. 
But when you start looking at the situation of countries like Greece, Portugal, but also France, Italy, and even the UK and the US, we are in a danger zone. This is the federal debt as of 2021, 108% of GDP. And for those who sometimes uh, have doubts, the U Europe has been doing a much better job than uh, the US in terms of maintaining decent budget deficit. And I saw that some of you have said that Europe hasn't done enough. I would like to uh, draw your attention on something. If you want to know what Europe has been doing, it's not just the 750 billion of the European Union. You have to add all the national interventions that are happening. The emerging market debt is essentially concentrated in Africa. And that is an area where we have to pay attention. It is also, like Latin America also, an area where we fight with China for supremacy. There are two solutions for the United States and partly for Europe. We need to reduce the expenses of defense. And let me be very candid with you, okay? It is obscene that we spend so much money. And it is obscene that the United States spent 732 billion, while China, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia, France, Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, South Korea, and Brazil represent together less than that. And it is because the United States is leading and that the excuses that are being used by the defense industry saying we need to catch up with Russia or we need to catch up with China. This is a sheer lie. We are in the United States, the people who spend the most on, def on defense. Does Europe spend as much as it should? Probably not, but somewhere it has to be rebalanced. That is on the expense side. Now, this is the theme that has been broached by President Biden also, and that Europe is now engaged. Corporates in the global competition have effectively become very low contributors to the budget of the country. The interest rates reduction have favored the debt of uh, the corporate world. Uh, and the Biden administration is now launching something that could be very uh, different than what we have known, because for the first time, he is considering a 15% tax on revenues that will be split where the revenues are happening. That is how you see the solution of the gamma the Googles, Amazon, and others. So that is happening. There is also something that he confirmed yesterday. Uh, the capital gain tax will be doubled. But the capital gain tax will be doubled for people who have revenues of a million dollars and more. So they represent 0.3% of the population. It also means that to be honest with you, it is very important from a moral standpoint, but it is also something that uh, will not solve the problem. The solution is in the increase of the corporate tax. And the question is whether Europe is refused to do it, is going to start harmonizing the tax system. And this is where the numbers are. The corporate income tax in the United States represents 7% of the revenues of the government. The rest is payroll, which is salary taxes, and individual income tax. In Europe and in the OECD countries, we have a slightly different model. By the way, this includes the US, and we are at 
in the situation where the corporate tax is 9.6%. And who is being taxed? Social insurance, consumption, and individual tax. So in both cases, we have been taxing the individuals to the detriment of the corporate world. The imbalance is unbearable. To manage to do this huge debt increase, the central banks have become fundamentally a gigantic sovereign fund invested in government bonds. There is no efficient oversight of central bank. They have become an instrument of uh, fiscal policy rather than monetary policy. And uh, the policy of interest rates has favored borrowers and expropriated savings. And for those of you who live on a pension or who know people who live on a pension, they know that whatever you've saved in the last 50 years is producing no revenue. What is important also is the last point. The foreign central banks have reduced their share of US Treasury from 35% of those shares to 25%. So we can no longer count on the rest of the world to finance. And this is why we see an increase in interest rate in the United States. But the policy of the central bank has been ineffective from an economic standpoint. And the most staggering chart here is the assets of the central bank and the S&P 500. The money that the central bank has been spending in all the QEs, including the one that happened for the pandemic, did go to the stock market. And that is the major challenge in terms of the role of capital markets exacerbating inequality. It's interesting also to see this chart. You see that the standard and course since 2010, so we're talking after the big crisis, has gone from 1,000 to almost 4,000. But look at the growth of the corporate profits. So don't believe that the stock price is the result of the performance of companies. It is the result of too much money chasing too many opportunities, too few opportunities, and a great deal of that is coming from the central bank policies. I'm finishing with this because as much as we continue to talk about those issues, I am trying to focus and I would like governments and companies to start looking at what could be the future black swan event. We have seen recently the 9-11 attacks, the 2008 global financial crisis, the 2020 pandemic. But if there is an OECD sovereign debt crisis, an acute water shortage, a global cyber attack, or a climate catastrophe. How do we prepare ourselves? How do we save and how do we address it? We need to strengthen the system and make sure that we prepare for what is a risk, some of which, like the sovereign debt crisis, could happen fairly quickly. So thank you so much for the time. I'm sorry I was longer than I was supposed to be, but now the floor is to the audience. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Professor Jeune. That was really fascinating. Um, 
again, we invite you to post your, your questions in the uh, chat and we will try to, in the 15 minutes that uh, are left, to come back on uh, the different uh, topics. And as we are receiving questions, I'd like maybe to uh, get started with some, some questions which build on the uh, questions that were received uh, through the registration uh, process. Uh, first of all, maybe to come back on the result of the uh, poll. Uh, you mentioned that um, we could not compare the six trillion stimulus plan in the US with the 750 billion uh, in Europe because it doesn't integrate the national uh, stimulus plans. Uh, nevertheless, um, most economics, economists expect today that the U.S. will reach its pre-pandemic GDP level uh, in a couple of months, and it will take one more year in Europe. So maybe the question here is, are we really doing sufficiently in Europe uh, in terms of uh, economic stimulus packages? Uh the two packages are different, of course. And uh, the first three trillion was tax reduction for companies and the wealthy. It was supposed to be for the pandemic, but only 900 billion of the three trillion went to the various system to support small companies and individuals. The second one, which is influenced by uh, Joe Biden, is much more targeted to those people. But the question that I have there is that today we are going too fast. And my main criticism in Europe, in the US, is that we have injected too much money too quickly. And it created this huge market boom and it did not create uh, a solution because to put money in the economy takes time. And what you see each time you see the three trillion, a trillion coming to these households, what you see is the increase in saving. The people don't spend it. You know, we had the same problem in Europe with the uh, agricultural policy. I mean, it's, a, it's one of the great stories of the agricultural policy. So, we do subsidies to agriculture because there is this crisis, this problem, and so on. And what you see is the savings account of the farmers increasing. So the question that we have to do is to target. I would not take the 1.9 or the 2 trillion that are going to happen and be added to the 6 trillion, which are on infrastructure. They are targeted on infrastructure, but they are not only targeted on infrastructure. So my impression at the moment is that we're living in a sea of liquidity and people are going wherever they can. And hopefully the increase of interest rates and an increase of inflation might uh, reduce the pressure on government debt. But we have created another inflation because there are two inflations in this world. The first one, is what we know, which is the increase of the price of goods and services. First, there's no increase in services. There are some increases in goods, including agricultural goods, and food will be more expensive because there are problems of logistics and transportation and so on. But we have created a 16 tri uh, trillion bubble, which is all, in all the stimulus, we have created 16 trillion of liquidities that are going to have to be repaid by the government. And the question is that these interventions around the world, this number comes from the uh, IMF, this number is staggering when you know that the total debt was 50 trillion before the pandemic which means that we have increased the public debt in one year by more than 30%. Yes, the US will get out fast, but I'm just going to give you one example. I am going to the restaurant and I'm going to Manhattan since June of last year. 
we have taken a risk. We had more debt, but we never had the lockdown that you had in the second phase and definitely in what is called the third phase or whatever it is. So the economy is in rebound at the moment. I would finish by saying there is one element that we need to take into consideration. And it was said again in the UK by a major uh, representative of the treasury. We do not know what the level of damage is. How many companies have we destroyed? How many jobs will we destroy? How many hunger and poverty issues are we going to, dis to appear when we stop? Because today, we have an economy under perfusion. But I look forward to do and to see is how the economy is going to rebound in it with its own means and not because it is financed by public money. Thank you very much. I would like to read the question that we received in the uh, chat. Uh, so from the chart on percent earnings versus stock price evaluation, isn't there a huge risk of stock market crash that if inflation rises and central banks rise up the cost of money, then the increase of cost of money will shut down the rise in stock market prices and actually provoke a crash? It's almost impossible for me, and I am not in the majority of it, to imagine that we are not going to have a severe correction of the stock price. We are in a situation where the price earning is at 40 times earnings instead of 20. Now, if the company profits double, then 40 becomes 20. But you have to be a huge optimist to believe that the market is going to see the profits of the company increase by 50. And we will have another problem if it is the case, because we have the social unrest that could happen also. But just to focus on that, I recognize that I have probably not made the money that I should have done because I have been extraordinarily personally careful with the stock market. And today, when I see some of the scandals that we've seen in the last weeks, I'm going to tell you my next book will be called Wall Street at the um, attack of democracy, Why? how financial markets exacerbate inequality. It is a problem, and it is a problem of democracy. Thank you. Um, maybe to come back to the very title of this conference, we received uh, ahead of the conference a lot of questions regarding the strategic position in Europe. Um, uh, one of these questions was, will the EU be taken in crossfire between US and other blocs, namely China? And the questions behind that is really what, uh, how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the strategic position of Europe in the future uh, between uh, uh, an established superpower and a rising superpower, which is China, in terms of trade, defense, technology, etc. You might not have perceived it. And my conversation when I go to Europe, because I did go to Europe, and with the, the, the various discussion that we had, is, you're a bunch of pessimists. Europe has actually come out of the four years of Trump with an enhanced global reputation. We stick to our guns. We stick to climate change to Iran, to the nuclear weapons with Russia and so on. Europe, if it gets its act together, which is the prerequisite of my presentation, is much more powerful than it thinks. It's bigger of population, just to start with, but also knowledge, capability, and, you know, there is a reason why 76% of the vaccines come from Europe. 
oh, I heard Mr. Trump talk about the Pfizer and everything. Well, that was done in Europe. It was done in Germany. And G&G, well, it's Janssen Pharmaceutica in Belgium. Okay, so I, I think that the biggest, if I were working in Europe and teaching in Europe, the biggest thing I would say is you better rebuild your self-confidence because the place of Europe is with the United States, but not as a junior member. And that is what Biden has to understand. And when Biden comes and he says, we are here to lead, he ignores the damage that the US has done. We are not expecting the US to lead. We only expect to be back to the table and to be part of the discussion and the negotiation. We're not children. We don't need sugar daddy. And that is a major element because the US continues to say that they are the best and the greatest in the world which they are no longer. I think the US is absolutely essential, but Europe has to decide on which terms it agrees with the US and it cooperates with the US and on which terms it begs to defer. And as I was saying in, Europe, uh, in, the, uh, in the Chinese situation, it's very important. Uh, and the US wants to destroy China. The US has this myth that they can have a war and change the regime, okay? How many wars have the US fought to, to take down a regime and fail? Do we need to go back to Vietnam? Was that a victory? So we have to be, you know, I am going to shock and I'm American, okay? And Belgium. I have to tell you something. Since World War II, the US has lost almost every single of the wars it undertook because they don't understand. They only know one model, military wars and so on. When you fight against terrorists, you have to do something else. When you fight against insurgents, you have to fight. So I think that Europe has to get its act together on the defense side and by the way, stop, stop not having the UK in the system, because the UK is absolutely essential from a nuclear capability. Thank you. So along the, the same line, we have a question here in the chat. Uh, U.S. defense, uh, you showed a graph with the U.S. defense spending, which is much more than, uh, well, equivalent to the 10 uh, uh, to, uh, following countries. And you stated that Russia is viewed as enemy. How, in your view, would U.S. react if Russia showed aggression with its 100,000 troops near Ukrainian border, which we just avoided, actually? Uh, but that's that's the that's the question. Will it will the U.S. increase its military presence in the EU again? Let me go back to the situation of Russia. Russia is having a deficit of population, but it also is in economic trouble. So Russia is not an economic power. Russia is not a military power. Russia, however, has a huge political influence. Where Russia is unacceptable to us and to the United States is when Russia is trying, and that's why they are the enemy, trying to destroy democracy by intervening in elections and so on and so forth. That is the core of the dispute between the US and the rest. And that there, they are an enemy. We Europeans, by definition, will have a different relationship than we, the Americans, because it's easy to have a view on Russia when you are a few thousand miles away. It's a different discussion. The same for the Middle East. We are close to the Middle East. We are close to Russia. And so Europe has to have a, a, a foreign policy that will take that into consideration. And the US has to understand that. The question is whether, we, whether there is a need to have the number of troops that are in Europe at the moment 
or whether Europe should have its own troops to defend itself is a very valid question. That's a question that Europe has started to avoid, but that's a question that Europe cannot, not, cannot avoid anymore. Thank you very much. I see that it's it's 7 p.m. I see that there are still 35 plus people online. Um, Professor, would you, would you like to, would you agree to spend another 10 minutes maybe or? Okay, great. Uh, that will allow us to address other, other uh, aspects. Um, so uh, coming back to, to China, we, we received a lot of questions regarding the uh, human rights aspect and um, whether what one of the question was whether the EU and the USA could agree on, on sanctions, common sanctions for non-respect of human rights in uh, China and maybe uh, somehow linked um, question to that. We've seen that with the tariffs war that uh, trade tariffs have more than doubled over one year. Um, was it a lose-lose situation and is there a way back and, and how do you see the Biden administration go forward in this tariff uh, war? So two aspects, human rights and tariffs. Yes, I'll take them separately. There is no compromise with China on human rights. There is no compromise with China on Hong Kong, Taiwan, and other parts of the world. We should be absolutely clear. So what does that mean? That means that on, on the Uyghur, we've started acting both together, US and the EU. And what is being imposed now to the Chinese who are absolutely furious is the tracking of goods. I would like to tell you that what is happening is that the, the textile that comes from China is no longer being exportable until they do that. Because what happens in the Uyghurs uh, region is they produce textile. So absolutely use everything we can. Because the second thing that I know from my interaction with the Chinese is that they only take seriously the people who are serious. And I think we have to be absolutely serious and continue to put the pressure. Over the past two months, now that Biden is back, Europe and the US have been, and others by the way, Canada and others, the UK, have been extremely vocal on the Uyghur, which exists for over a year. Okay? And it infuriates the China the Chinese, okay? And let me be candid. Let the Chinese be furious. It's one of the good things. And the problem that China has is that it refuses to bend on the human rights side because it considers that to be an internal matter. But the reality is that the future will force them to have a different attitude of human rights because they are going to realize increasingly that some of their projects are not working because of that. And you have heard about the Silk Road and so on. This is failing big way. And I think that the, the China has a huge influence on the world and an increased influence in Asia. And it's extremely worrying. And the China Sea issue is essential. And they do what they do. But the reality is, does anybody believe that we are not going to be there if China tries to do anything to Korea, South Korea, or to Japan? I think the China has to, is testing the limit. Russia is testing the limit. And they better get it back. Each time they cross the red tape or whatever, they need to have an answer that is unequivalent and unanimous. Those are the two elements. And if we believe that something that you do is not acceptable, all the issue of Myanmar, all the issue of the Rio Roiga, and so on, we have to be there and we have to use our economic uh, power and others 
to create a level playing field. Now, those countries are dictatorships. Okay? So let's not get carried away. We are not going to overturn Xi Jinping. And Putin is not going to be replaced by the United States. We have to be let the political system work, but on the human rights side, there is no compromise. Now, the second question was on regarding the tariff wars that that yeah, we've we seen. Paid. As you've seen, uh, the deficit between uh, the uh, China and the US uh, has increased. Uh, the tariffs have failed. And uh, it was, as I told you, self-inflicted. And this is because there are some people in Washington who are damn stupid. If you know that the bulk of the exports from China to the US is products made by US companies, if you put a tariff, who is going to pay the bill? The US consumer. So it fell back, and all of a sudden, the agriculture in the US that was exporting to China and other countries in a big way have not been able to export. Now, they got the money, but they saw their crop completely corrupt. So we have to be very careful. I don't believe in tariffs. I don't believe in protectionism. I believe in self-interest. And I think when you have a decent self-interest, then you compromise because it's a negotiation. And you cannot have 100% of your self-interest. Trump believed in that and never achieved. Thank you very much. I, maybe one or two last questions, and I'm reading from the uh, chat um, a question from Acto, which was who was with us before we, we we started the conference. So I was wondering how Biden administration can change the current status quo with the extremely authoritarian government in Russia and Turkey. The authoritarian government has been uh, sorry uh, <laughs> trying to the. Government has been discussing internally the Turkish exit from NATO, which is heavily supported by Russia. Do you believe Biden's aggressive stand against Turkey can make closer Russia and Turkey, which is the worst case scenario? The problem of Turkey, because I talked about Russia, the problem of Turkey is that it wants its cake and eat it. And Erdogan Will not, would not be re-elected if the elections were honest. We know that already. He has lost the support of its people. But he buys weapons in the US that all of a sudden lead the uh, US to take measures on the equipment that they give to Turkey. Turkey is in between what I would call the Christian world and Muslim world and between Eastern Europe and Eastern Europe and everything that you can do. That is the situation that they benefit from. But in the conflict between what I call the West and China and Russia, even though there are some common borders, there is something that Turkey will have to do is make a choice. And being a partner of Russia is a losing game for Turkey. Thank you very much. Maybe a last one be before I, I uh, uh, hand over to Chantal. Uh, what events do you think might precipitate an OECD sovereign debt crisis? I think that you, you, you had a slide about black swans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by definition, if it's an OECD, it has to be in the OECD country. I would like to say one thing. The European Union is the, the sorry, the sovereign debt situation in the world is more uneven than it has ever been. So it is not everybody. 
And there are some problems that are specific to emerging markets. And the United States, uh, sorry, the IMF and the World Bank are working on that very actively to avoid default. But in Europe, we have some weak numbers. Uh, Mario Draghi has taken the bull by the horn with his project that he announced two days ago. And I really hope he will succeed. I disagree with what he did with the ECB, but I hope he will succeed to fix Italy. The problem is that Italy has had seven prime ministers in the last nine years. The same with Venezuela has had seven sovereign crises since World War II. So the problem uh, of the sovereign crisis is that we know who the weak links are. But you have to remember one thing, a sovereign crisis can be provoked by elements that are not necessarily in the sovereign element. And I'm just going to give you one example that you need to pay a lot of attention to. Six months ago, following the policy of the Central Bank of Low Interest Rates, the 10-year bonds of the United States government were producing a yield of 25 basis points, 0.25%. It went as high as 1.8% in the last month. It is at 1.6 today. When interest rates go up, the budget deficit increases. And when that happens, then you have the vicious circle of the sovereign debt. And yes, Italy is fragile and big because it's two trillion. The same as France is big. Have you heard France talking about its debt? Have you Italy talked about its debt? My problem today is the denial. We have to be honest to our populations and tell them that we have arrived at a point where we can no longer continue to spend and spend. The pandemic was a catastrophe. We spend a lot of money, but we have to stop it. And the sooner the better. It's almost quarter by seven. Um, we still have uh, ton, tons of questions and we could, uh, it's always too short and uh, we would have loved to, to continue, but at some point you have to uh, fix a, a limit. So thank you so much, Professor Joe, for this uh, fascinating discussion. Thank you very much to all participants. I hope that next time we'll be able to uh, organize this in a physical setting. Um, so thank you very much. Good evening, and I'll hand over to Chantal. Thank you, thank you, Raphael. Uh, thank you, Professor Uge. That was really a wonderful presentation. It has really attracted lots of questions. As usual, with a topic like this, we barely scratched the surface. But I'm personally very glad that we expanded a little bit beyond the EU and the US relations because we're living in a global world, and we cannot really dismiss what's happening in Russia or in Asia in general. And I'm also glad we approached a little bit about the, the Turkey subject because they're really neighbors. So that's been really, really great. Thank you everybody for being here with us tonight, for having stayed on and, uh, and uh, for, for your participation, for all the great questions you, you send in and you, you put in the chat as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for staying as long and thank you for inviting me. We we'll hope we can speak again at some point. And I think the great thing with Zoom is that we can really have people. Uh, I was really, really pleased to have people from other parts uh, than the U US and Europe, uh, as far as Singapore, Morocco, and, uh, and uh, Turkey, as mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. For those who want, we, we can leave the 